I just drank a little bit of my grandmother, out of morbid curiosity. I think Reddit will have a kick with this. My mamaw passed away years ago when I was 12, and it hit me severely in the gut with unresolved grief and depression. She has been cremated, and my mom left me the responsibility to keep her urn in my room. I have since made her a shrine in her memory. My mom has now moved into a new place, and now lives across the states, and I'm planning to visit her in the next week. She requested that I bring some of Mamaw to spread her ashes in the river nearby, at her new house. Usually, she likes to do this when we find a new place or a beach to take a little bit of someone we held close to our memory. Now, this is the first time I've touched an urn. It's never been open since her cremation. I and my mother are very spiritual people, and I have the irrational fear that touching the urn somehow will cause some form of hex or misjudgment on my part. So, I've never touched it. But, I cannot take the entire thing with me, so I opened it and poured some into a tightly closed jar to take with on the trip. In order to get the ashes out, I used a smaller measuring cup to accurately get a portion out of the container. With this, a film of residue was left in the smaller jar. In my extremely emotional, vulnerable state, and morbid curiosity. When I went to wash out the small jar, I took a few sips from the murky water. I have since put the urn back in its place and refused to look in my mammal's direction. I feel so conflicted. This grief is coming back and now I feel a heavy sense of guilt and weight, like a child who accidentally broke a vase. I'm not sure if I'm overreacting or I truly just did something bad. Parts of me wish I never did this, and told my mom I couldn't promise her wish. The other part of me is conflicted with the immoral action that I committed a meager act of cannibalism, if it's even considered to be that anymore. I'm lost, confused, and now thrown back into a state of grief, as if a part of my very dead mammal has risen from the dead and has come back to haunt me for this stupid action. My dumbass gave myself metal poisoning to get out of work, and it didn't even work. So I've got this coworker, Stan, right? And I had a non-essential doctor's appointment yesterday, as well as a shift that day. And I asked Stan if he could take it away from me around four days in advance. And he said, sure. However, the shift swap didn't even get approved until the day of. And Stan suddenly decided he didn't want to do it anymore and flaked like 30 minutes beforehand. The policy for calling in sick is that we have to do it at least three hours before the start of our shift. I called in and asked my boss what I could do about it. He apologized and said it was on him for not approving the shift on time because Stan called in and said he couldn't make it anymore. So if either him or I didn't come in that day, it would be a no call, no show on my record. It pissed me off and I got an idea. A couple of months ago, I took a zinc supplement in the morning before having breakfast because I planned to eat at a cafe before heading to class, and I didn't know it was dangerous to take them on an empty stomach. I got awful stomach problems and doubled over and puked after about an hour, but after a few more hours, I was okay again. So I had the idea to try that again, and I took three times the amount I did last time because I had already eaten beforehand. It gets to my shift time, and I'm still feeling okay, so I headed in and was hoping I would get myself to throw up again so I could go home. Unfortunately, for me, an hour passed, then two, then three, and four, and I was reaching the end of my shift anyways, and I had already missed my doctor's appointment. It feels like the god of fuck you was staring down at me, because as soon as I got home, I doubled over the toilet and vomited violently, like the puke was just waiting for me to finish working. How considerate. It's the next day now, and I'm constipated as shit. Edit. I like my job, and I don't really need to quit. I just felt super petty that day since Stan was being an ass. My friend and I burned down a house when I was a kid. When I was around eight years old, I lived in an area that had a lot of summer homes. After summer was over and the home was empty, 
my friend and I would break in. Break in is used loosely. A lot of times windows were unlocked, or even sometimes a door. We used to look for money because we loved going to McDonald's. One time, we even found a lockbox, busted that open with a sledgehammer. We usually didn't take anything but money. There were TVs and beds, but I was eight. What would I do with any of that? There were almost never any toys. I did take a really cool looking mini statue and I still have it to this day. We were in one house playing with those long wooden matches. One of them lit the shag carpet. We couldn't get it out. We rode our bikes out of there like the devil was on our heels. Some days later, we both rode our bikes back to this house and the place was burned to the ground, destroyed, nothing left. I can still smell it. I also remember I stepped on a nail and it went into my foot, hurt like hell. We rode our bikes away and never talked about it again. My family moved away when I was in fifth grade and I lost contact with the kid. I have never told anyone. I told a guy that my trazodone would get him high so he would leave me alone. When I was 18, I was at this party and this guy kept hitting on me and he was getting kind of handsy. At one point, I was looking through my bag and he heard my pills. He had been glued to me all night and I was too nice to tell him to fuck off. He asked, what kind of pills you got? And I kind of hesitated because I knew what had to be done but didn't know if I had the heart to do it. Do you want one? I asked. He kind of smiled in this like way that said he was intrigued. Do they get you high? I told him they did. He took one and passed out in the driveway 30 minutes later. He was okay, though, not that I care. In all seriousness, I of course know now that this had the potential to be much worse. I suffer from CPTSD, and I think in that moment I kind of panicked and made what I thought was the best decision given the circumstances. And I didn't consider that the pill could actually harm him because his brain chemistry is different than mine, and I'd been on it for years drinking or not. I definitely don't condone sharing prescriptions under false pretenses with anyone. I do think it's just kind of a funny story about a situation that could have gone very differently. And I'm not going to condemn myself for making a rash decision when I was potentially in danger. I was 18, I'm 28 now, and I've learned how to say no and avoid dangerous situations. I just had to learn the hard way, unfortunately. I once had a meth head hold me hostage in my own apartment. Dude got in through my back door and was completely bonkers and kept trying to grope me and said some pretty scary things. Luckily, I was cooking at the time, so I fed him poutine laced with crushed clonopin and as soon as he passed out, I called the cops who were looking for him for some type of violent crime, probably the scariest hour of my life. For years. I didn't even remember this happened. I just blocked it from my memory. I'm not exactly sure of my age when this happened, but I believe I was around four or five years old. It was morning. My mom and I went to a pharmacy a couple blocks away from our home. As soon as she was getting back in the car, a man approached her from behind and told her to act as if she knew him and to sit in the passenger seat. She noticed he had a gun, so she complied. He sat in the driver's seat and drived. During the whole way, my mom tried to calm me down telling me that he was a friend and needed a ride, while I sat in silence. He drove us to a road where he got out of the car, stole the money my mom had with her, and told her not to call the police. After that, she just drove us back home. Well, that could have gone terribly bad. Glad he didn't harm either of you. Possibly the plan was a good old-fashioned rape and murder. He had complete control over them and already had them isolated. I'm guessing something else spooked him or he figured he didn't have enough time or didn't have his cover-up planned out right. Or maybe he just lost his nerve. It's possible you ran into a fledgling serial killer and the next victim probably wasn't so lucky. He could have just been broke, bro. <laughs> Masked people in the woods. This is around 2017 in spring or fall. I was 19 at the time, and I live in Germany. Me and my friends used to hang out at a friend's basement, smoke the good stuff, and play video games or watch movies. 
until late at night. My best friend at the time lived just a couple houses down the street from where I lived, and usually, it was the two of us riding our bikes back home. There were two routes that we used to get home, one through the city, or the other, significantly shorter one, through a small forest, maybe one kilometer, completely dark, but proper forest road. That route made a 90 degree turn to cross some rails and a major unlit highway via a bridge. We only took that route when we were equipped with lights and in a group of at least two people because there were a lot of bores and you don't want to be on your own in case something happens. So one night we set out to ride home, both quite stoned and maybe a couple beers in, but not off the deep end. As we got close to that 90 degree turn where the road heads up to the bridge, my friend who was riding in front suddenly breaks because there was a relatively large tree laying across the road. We both took our bikes and lifted them over the tree and continued. Maybe 10 to 20 meters later, we suddenly spot a fire on the side right at the junction where we had to make our turn, just the size of a small campfire. We both got a little slower as we saw the fire, and then, when getting closer, we spotted six or seven people around the fire, forming a semicircle, all facing us. All of them were wearing long white dresses or gowns, with masks. Not KKK masks, but rather like a sailor's hat with veils. A couple of seconds went by. We were just staring at them, and I guess they were staring at us. Then one of them moved towards us, and we started to sprint away towards the bridge, and we didn't stop until we were on a well-lit road again. That's been the craziest story among me and my friends ever since. But please, people, let's not meet again. Oh, look, I said it. I said the infamous thing. I said the quote. <laughs> the man stopped me from being kidnapped. My mother was stationed at Cadena Air Force Base around the late 2010s. And being a military child at the age of 12, my life had reset once again. I didn't have friends again and I had to learn an entire new neighborhood. I didn't really have anything that made me ecstatic. That is, except the Pokemon League held on base. It was ran by a few people who earned their judge cards from Nintendo and held tournaments and just open game nights. It was really fun picking up the card game, playing in the video game, and they even had a small gym and an Elite Four system. I made a lot of friends, and one of them was one of the judges, who, I am thankful still to this day, because if it wasn't for him, I may not be here right now. The judge in question, who we will call Professor Getsu for the sake of anonymity, was a nice dude. He was the youngest of the three and wore a white professor getup. He looked maybe on the edge of his teens, early 20s, with dark hair and glasses and a skinny frame. He was extremely helpful to newcomers, sort of like the big brother that we all could look up to and strive to be in our children's cars and video games. Even if his game name of Getsu was a bit nerdy, even for me, he was always one of the last people to leave, hoping to clean up and he supposedly lived nearby. This last thing is important for what's about to happen. It was a bit of a colder night when the event ended. I was sitting outside in the parking lot, scrolling through memes that my friends texted me as I waited for my parents to arrive to pick me up. I was just kind of zoning out as the time clicked by when I heard someone nearby. Hey, hey girly, you play Pokemon? I would look up at some really big dude, kind of chubby looking. I saw him every now and then in the events and he didn't really stand out too much. I give a small nod, said, yeah, I do as he gives this wide smile, like creepy wide. He starts walking forward and I'm hit with this nasty stench like bad body odor. I blink a bit as I see he's walking from a black sedan with its back door open. I got this cool card collection. Come here, let me show you. Now, my parents have always taught me stranger danger, but my kid brain thought, hey, he went to events and I saw him, so he should be fine. At least, so I thought, until he grabbed my wrist and started to drag me to the sedan. To say I immediately started screaming is an understatement. Stinky didn't care though. He was still dragging me, saying how I will, quote unquote, have fun. 
and throwing out things about trading cards. Like someone listening would think that he was dealing with a whiny kid. I honestly thought that I was going to be taken and I would never see my mom and dad again. That I would be on the back of a milk carton and never seen again. Silly, I know, but I was rather sheltered about dying and death at the time. Thankfully, Professor Getsu had walked out at that very moment, presumably on his way to walk home. All I know is I hear the sound of fabric hitting this dude's face as Professor had swung his professor coat right into dude's face. I feel his hand go to where the dude's grabbing my arm, and I see his hand grab Stinky's pinky finger and yank back hard. Stinky let go and yelled like an animal as Professor pushed me back behind him as he yanked his coat off of the dude. He then kicked at the back of the dude's knees as he caused him to buckle as Professor grabbed his wrists and pulled back on them. Stinky groaned in even more pain as Professor looked at him with just a cold look in his eyes. The big brother figure was gone and something else was in its place. And I think I was a bit scared of it. Professor's tone of voice when he spoke didn't help either. Like icy daggers lingered with his words against Stinky. If I see you back here or doing this shit to my charges, this will pale in comparison to what Japanese prisons will do to you. Stinky would scramble away and get into his car and peel out of the parking lot. The professor glaring at him till he was out of sight. He would then guide me inside of the venue, buy me some fish and chips, and sit down with me until my parents arrived. That cold persona he had when he kicked that dude was gone. He was back to being the big brother that I knew. To be frank, that frightened me. I didn't quite understand why the teenager was so aggro. I only later learned that Professor Getsu was a black belt who taught kids how to defend themselves with his mother at the local activity center. I suspect he had something of a protective persona or something in his own life that led him to act in as much a way. He explained the situation to my folks when they arrived. I wasn't allowed to go to the events and league as much as I used to, but I did from time to time. Professor Getsu was still his normal self at the events and helping people, but he would stop coming to the events a year afterwards, his license having expired and his father moving out of the country soon. Reaching about the same age as he was and with a little sibling on my own, I sympathize with how, for a brief moment, he became something terrifying just to make sure I was safe. Oh, and as for Stinky, he never showed up to the events and he was either banned or just scared of Professor Getsu. I wish the professor a good life, and I hope he's doing well. As for Stinky, I wish that we never, ever meet again. Stinky? You called him Stinky? Your traumatic memory, and you nickname him Stinky? Hey. Hey, girly. You play Pokemon? Hey, girly, you... You play, you play the Pokemon. You play, you play Pocket Monsters. <laughs> <laughs>